Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our fifth and last Innovation Festival 22 on-course session. Today, we're going to be focused on the smart tech bubble, and we've got some fantastic sprint leads and sponsors to hear from today. My name is Martin Jackson, and I'm Head of Strategy and Product Management at Northumbrian Water Group, and I'll be joined with Angela McCosker, our Head of Innovation. I've been fortunate enough to be involved in many of the festivals that we've held to date. And what we learned pretty quickly on in, in that process was it's really about what happens in the days, weeks and months after the event that really matters in taking those ideas and delivering value from them. This on-course session is really about lifting the lid on that and demonstrating what's happened since. And just a reminder, our 2022 festival was amazing. And I think it's really about how we all came back together at our spiritual home at the race course for the first time in a few years. With over 2,000 people joining us from 38 sectors and 33 different countries. It's brilliant to have welcomed over 600 different organisations alongside the 600 staff from NWL and Essex and Suffolk. I'm also reliably informed over 5,000 pancakes were consumed, I think it was on the Wednesday, and a lovely story about that and such is the nature of the festival. A lot of those were actually cooked by one of our colleagues in the testing team within IS. So Fergal, you've got a career after Northumbrian Water Group in pancakes if you choose to pursue it. What I really love about the event is, you know, we've had some fantastic outcomes over the years, you know, things such as new as as came from the festival. And we're incredibly proud of those achievements both you know, working as a, as, a, as a group, as an industry, and with some of our wider partner ecosystem. But I, I really love the serendipitous nature of the event and those small collisions that are occurring en masse in almost hundreds or even maybe in thousands over the course of the week. And we had some fantastic examples of that. And actually one of those that I think we talked a lot about in July that came from one of the sprints that you'll hear from today around the control room of the future where it just so happened that we had a colleague from the business involved in that sprint that said, wouldn't it be great if I could do this? And it just so happened that the person that was able to make that happen and indeed had the tools available to them already was involved in that. So we had the opportunity to connect those two people and I think they got their heads together and within a couple of days and by day two of the sprint, we actually had a little prototype that's now in use today within our organisation. So that, that's just a fantastic example of the festival. And I think alongside, you know, the fantastic large outputs that we get, it's really nice to see those things happen. And I think it's really hard to measure and quantify that across the scale of the festival and all of those things that are happening day out, day in, day out over the course of the four days. We also had within the SMEC smart tech bubble, we had three projects that attracted some of the seed funding, um, and that was the Cybersecurity Shared Apprenticeship Scheme, the Measure of Success Smart Meter Sprint, and the Control Room of the Future. So you're going to hear a little bit more about those over the course of this session. And naturally, being a leader in technology, there's things within this session that I'm fascinated about and whether they go on to, to be seed funded or whether they go on to be part of one of our innovation bids. You know, there's so many different opportunities from this bubble and across all of the other bubbles that will feature in our, our technology roadmaps through our product teams, through our infrastructure teams, in our SCADA and OT teams. You know, there's just an abundance of things that we're moving forward at pace. And it's fine to see that that happens at different speeds. Sometimes that's very quickly, as we saw with that example of the prototype. Some of those things are slow burn and, and that's fine too. That's just the nature of innovation. And we've learned that over the time that we've been running the festival. So really excited to get into it and hear from some of the sprints today. But at that point, I'll hand over to Angela McCosker, who's going to guide us through the session. Good afternoon everybody and it's great to be here in the smart tech bubble sharing with you all of the exciting things that have happened since the festival in this particular space and it is fair to say that over the last six festivals that this particular space has really turned out some absolutely brilliant uh, examples and projects that are really making a difference to our business and so far we've run 152 sprints and hacks and many of these ideas 
uh, pop out ideas that can already be implemented really quickly into the business, but also things that maybe take a little bit of a slower burn to be reapplied. But I think the smart tech space is one of those spaces that we actually realise value from these ideas really quite quickly at pace. And we've had some brilliant examples of that. Currently in this particular space, we have 10 live projects within our innovation pipeline, and these are currently potentially worth over 10 million pounds annually to our business if they're successful, because there is always a bit of an if when you're working on an innovation project. It's not a given that it's going to succeed, which I guess makes innovation exciting, but also perhaps a little bit risky sometimes. We've also hacked a lot of topics over the years, everything from our bread and butter topics like the obvious leaking, floodage, flood, flooding, blockages, uh, void properties, water quality, carbon, pollution, response to storm and even rats, which is perhaps a little bit more left field for us. But I think it's uh, the insights that we gain from interrogating these big data sets and can indeed combining them with other sets and having other people look at our data sets has yielded knowledge that can be really rapidly rapidly implemented into our business and to really make some huge impacts. And we have some excellent examples around identifying leakage hotspots so we can improve our leakage, uh, uh, our leakage scores, uh, blockage hotspots, finding uh, that uh, real insights that can help us direct our bin the wipe activities um, and also uh, correct void property identification and many, many other examples, all of which have been implemented since previous festivals. Out of the 2019 Innovation Festival came the power of Zed, and this is where we used our ability when we're out in the field to actually measure the depth of pipes that then can be implemented into our databases. So then we can more safely and accurately use that data when we go to future jobs. And this again has been implemented and is, and is making a real big difference. It also means that we can take the right, the, the correct equipment to an excavation, which saves time and makes things a lot more efficient. In 2020, the digital teams got uh, heavily involved in the development of the, de of the developer portal that we were working on with uh, Salesforce. And this has really helped us improve our DMEX score and drive satisfaction in this space. And also in 2020, we worked with Netcall, who are a load code, low code app um, sponsor, and they uh, already in a week actually created a prototype app that then we deployed. And guess given the cost of living crisis that we're all currently experiencing is a great way for us to really be able to help our customer control their payments and have a better control over their bills. And this work has really paved the way for significant work in this area that we're moving forward with. So lots of great examples from this bubble where we've really made a difference to our customers, which is really what it's all about. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Steve Blanks, who's going to share with us the work that's been going on in the measure of success um, sprint that was sponsored by Suez. So over to Steve. Thank you very much, Angela. So uh, smart meters. Um, so we, over the last uh, couple of innovation festivals, have been looking at ways to basically look at how we can make our smart meters smarter. Now, one of the things that is a massive constraint with our current meters are that at the moment they use conventional lithium batteries. Now that poses a considerable number of challenges. Firstly, your meter um, can only capture data every hour and transmit that once a day. And what that means is there's a massive chat and that's all constrained by the battery. So all those new smart meters going in can't really do much more. They can't have additional sensors like pressure and temperature. They can't even transmit data at a more frequent rate without deteriorating the battery. So our sprint, what we discovered in our July sprint was a hydro powered smart meter. Now this is an inline smart meter that's used in France developed by a company called Hydrow, and that's a slightly different spelling to the word hydro. Um, and what that did, that does, is it uses the natural flow of mains pressure water, so there's no battery within this particular device. It takes the water through a chamber, it charges a small capacitor, and then it gives you the meter reading. Now, what they're able to do with that in trials in France in an inside environment, so these use inside, they're not fitted outside in the external environment. 
they're able to get minute by minute transmission of data. So without any impact on the power and currently those meters currently have a shelf life of about 10 years. So we looked at this and thought, wow, this is a real game changer in the industry. But the one thing that they haven't developed is a concentric meter. But we thought, right, OK, there's a lot of benefits to this. So first of all, looking at that. So if you could leverage that sort of existing micro turbo hardware technology developed by this French company, then you could use that mains pressure water, removing the need for disposable batteries. So there's a massive environmental impact here. If we don't need to put all those kind of uh, lithium based batteries into landfill or hard to dispose of processes. Um, and also it's the materials that the meters made of out of. They're really difficult to unpick and recycle. So the millions and millions and millions of meters going in, obviously we're building up and storing up a legacy that potentially is going into some sort of very difficult to dispose of uh, environmental impact. So if you can get that limitless power from these meters, enabling once a minute real time communication of data, that potentially is a real game changer in our sector. Um, because we are lagging behind our energy counterparts in gas and electricity in terms of meters that we currently use. And obviously we're in that cost of living crisis, as Angela mentioned. So actually, if you could get that 24-7, 365 days a year without impact in the, the meter, then potentially you could do a lot with that data. Now you could then start to look at real time views of customer water usage and consumption by activity and appliance such as your washing machine, even a toilet flush and showers, which typically are the main consumers of energy linked to water usage. And then you could look at bespoke and contextualised efficiency measures that could be communicated to individual different types of customer groups from vulnerable customer groups right the way up to people that have swimming pools. Um, and you could utilise the existing concentric meter if you could convert that into a a concentric meter, then you can use that for retrofitting purposes in existing boundary boxes because we're not trying to develop something here that would potentially change or disrupt the current processes. What we're doing is saying, can you do something innovative with that meter where it uses and harnesses that water? You've got that consistent power. You put them in the boundary box and then all you're doing is you're just unscrewing an old one and putting this new one in. And then you can incorporate potentially within the meter casing um, different comms components. So where we've got comms challenges, you know, in hard, rural, you know, hard to reach areas such as rural areas, we could use different comms uh, that could be powered through a new concentric design. And so what are we doing next? Well, the big thing that came through, obviously, the innovation fund that, that Offwat announced, we are actually in the process of writing a, a bid for the Catalyst Fund. This is we're going for the full two million catalyst fund to develop the world's first hydro powered concentric meter. And what we've designed is 10 work packages all the way from ideation. So that's creating the idea. So we're starting with the existing meter design. We're starting with the existing hydro powered unit. That's an inline version. And we're seeing how that can be combined, if possible, into very early prototypes that we can test uh, over a two month period to fully um, tooled and produced with the right materials um, beta prototypes. Now what we have is two phases within this offbot bid. We have the enabling partners. These range from engineering companies, uh, uh, people that look at the testing of the meter, the metrology side, um, people who look at the flow and modeling through the water because we're taking the water instead of going in a straight line with an inline meter, we're taking up round a bend down and out using a little wheel a flywheel to create that turbine energy and then the second phase is really giving this to a number of water companies throughout the uk so they can test these beta prototypes to look at what kind of granular data can we get back how can we use that data in a really informative way to benefit the customer how can that data be used on a community level so it's looking at the societal impacts that you can use that data for and then on an environmental perspective how can those meters be made of more sustainable materials? And also the removal of batteries will create something of a, will reduce our, then our carbon footprint and our legacy into the environment. So our partners on this bid include a range of people from the big multinationals such as Suez, who are our key partner, and Suez do a lot of work on smart meters in Europe, 
to product designers such as Octo, engineering companies such as PDL, Hydro, the turbine uh, producers in France, and also Southern Water, Southeast Water and SES Water, to name but a few. So next steps, we currently, as uh, was highlighted at the beginning, we have £20,000 worth of Kickstarter funding to trial the inline version of the hydrometer in a test environment, such as the watershed by Northumbria Waters HQ. And what we're looking at there is, does it operate efficiently under variable water pressure? Um, we'll be using that in the context, hopefully, if we get that over in time, uh, we'll be we're currently writing that bid. We'll be using some of that research to feed into the bid and the bid submission is on the 8th of December. And we're hoping that we're going to get a, a decision and hopefully a successful award, because I'm always an optimist, in April 23. And if successful, we'll commence that two year project. So running those different phases of enablement and also testing through a two year cycle starting in July 23. Now it's worth also mentioning that at the same innovation festival, we also have demonstrated something called the hydro powered shower head of which I've taken delivery of one of these um, to try and look at, you know, the flow of the water goes through a shower head. You've got a color changing aspect and you can see in that picture where it changes color for every 10 liters of water that you use. And it, basically what that's doing is it's using color as a way of psychologically impacting you to say, actually, if I'm moving into a red zone, I'm starting to use a considerable amount of water and maybe I should switch it off because we're all guilty and particularly at this time of year, standing underneath a hot shower for longer than we should be. So we're currently ordered 96 shower heads. They're being trialed with high consumption customer groups in the southeast of England through our smart metering program. Um, unfortunately, due to the current customs regulations, they're currently stuck uh, on this side of the channel in customs. And that's it. I think rather than take any questions, I'll hand over to Angela. Thank you very much, Steve. That was a, a great demonstration of uh, how our innovation festival uh, really does help us get the consortia that can go off uh, after uh, like the likes of the innovation off what fund and other funds. So uh, it's a brilliant to see. Love the colour changing shower head. Uh, I, I really hope that we can get those out of customs soon and into, into consumers hands. So uh, look forward to hearing more on that one. So now we're going to hand over to Tony Smith, who's going to share what went on in the cybersecurity in the community sprint run by Cyber North. Thanks, Angela. Uh, I guess most of you are aware that there is a significant skills gap in a lot of areas within IT and cyber security is probably one of the world's biggest areas at the moment. Um, during our sprint or the output from our sprint, we realised that it wasn't actually a skills uh, shortage. It was more to do with an experience shortage. And there were lots of people coming out of university and colleges who'd been doing cyber degrees, but they weren't getting any, any experience. And then companies weren't wanting to employ them because they didn't have the experience. So we started looking at apprenticeships and how this, this might work. And that posed a problem where a lot of smaller companies with small internal cybersecurity teams couldn't manage apprentices. So the discussion spread and we started looking at shared apprentice schemes. And this would be where somebody would do an apprenticeship and they would move around various businesses within the Northeast during that apprenticeship to gain experience. So we managed to get some seed funding for our sponsor, who was Cyber North, to go out and review the marketplace, look what was happening, uh, both from a, a supplier perspective, um, when I mean suppliers, it's, it's sort of the universities, the colleges, also from the perspective of the students, what, what they would like to do and other training providers. And what we found there was only two cyber apprenticeships in the Northeast, but they weren't shared. Um, one of them was with Gateshead at level four and the other one was Northumbria University were the sponsors for it. But those apprenticeships only took place in London and they were managed by QA training company. So after lots of meetings with various different stakeholders, uh, we discovered that last year uh, there was something set up which you would need to join if you wanted to do a shared apprenticeship scheme, and it's called the Flexi Jobs Apprenticeship Agency. So it's set up by government. You register on there and you need a parent company who will manage the shared apprenticeship scheme. What the parent company will do is they will um, manage the 
um, students manage all the funding, set up the training and be the liaison and, and, and set up the, the placements with the various different businesses who want to be part of it. This all sounds great, except that particular programme was only open for three months last year as a bit of a pilot. And believe it or not, for this to take place, we need to get legislation signed off by, by government. Um, so in summary, to get this legislation signed off, we need to now start having conversations with the Department for Education. Um, we do know from the conversations of companies in, in the Northeast that we've had that there are quite a few of us who are keen to get involved in this. We know the students are keen to get involved. We know Cyber North would possibly be the, the conduit who would pull this all together and that um, the, the various different elements would all pull together. Now, like I say, the next part is to have a conversation with the Department for Education to understand how we can get this through and signed off um, in Parliament. And it's probably to, I guess, after that conversation to build a business case and, and promote it and push it forward that way. So initially what seemed, I guess, particularly or seemed like quite a simple process isn't. Um, as simple as what it might seem because of the way the apprenticeship is apprentices would be managed, but we still think it's doable and we're still going to continue to, to press and, and see where we get on with that. Um, there's a load more detail that I could give you in conversations with various different providers, but I think that that probably covers it. Uh, and hand you back to Angela. Thanks, Tony. Uh, great topic to look at and great that you've identified where the gap is and what is needed for that. Uh, a bit of a shame that there are blockers, but you know what? That's that's what uh, the Innovation Festival often uh, has to come up against is things that currently aren't possible. So uh, I really hope that uh, that there are other ways and means to uh, to help this uh, fill in this gap that clearly exists in this space. So uh, we'll watch it with bated breath to see what happens next. So now we're going to hand over to uh, understand a little bit more about what has gone on in the control room of the Future Sprint. And we have uh, Andre Volkov, who's going to be co-hosting with Wes Little from Snyder Electric. Over to Andre. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And my name is Andre Volkov. I work for Northumbrian Water in procurement team. I just wanted to, to give you a few words to just summarize what happened back in July there. So what happened was David Walsh, who was our regional control center manager and Jerry Trowbridge, OT and SCADA manager, teamed up with Schneider and spotted an opportunity uh, in our control rooms. There's probably something else we could do. So that's where the idea of this control room of the future originated. So um, we thought, OK, there's there's a lot of things happening in the control room. The control room controllers have power over so monitoring the network health and making decisions, helping to make decisions how to react to different events, to different alarms, alerts. So they could be empowered more how to do that. So what we did find that uh, we, we, we would run this. So we, we went into a three day sprint during the Innovation Festival and as it, like me from procurement. So we teamed up, you know, our facilitator, Eddie. We had lots of other people from other com water companies for other water companies, other departments, people with different backgrounds to look at what we've got and what else we can do. And so we went into an agile sprint. Work three, so starting with looking at gap analysis, understanding what it is and what's required, and then uh, coming up with ideation ideas and ultimately shortlisting those ideas to three key ideas, one of which Martin already mentioned that it's actually one of the things that happened. It brought together two people and uh, one solution was born the, in the second day of the sprint. But besides that, we also came up with another two ideas, a medium term and a long term idea. Uh, and the, the medium term idea was, OK, how we can take those systems and the information from those systems and empower our controllers to then uh, do a bit of forecasting and forward looking. And that's where this medium term idea came from. And there was another third idea and uh, it's called uh, the room of requirement. And maybe we'll hear a bit more about it. But what, what I wanted to focus back on this medium term idea and uh, the functionality that uh, we, in cooperation with Schneider, we have developed and wanted to pass on to Les Whittle, please, to uh, demonstrate uh, what we came up with. Over to you, Les, please. 
Was? If you could unmute yourself, Wes, please. OK, so what we were looking to try and do was take a lot of existing data sets from within um, Northumbrian water and look at the type of things in terms of information that was captured around uh, assets, availability, volume of each asset, understand where those assets would be on a map. So this isn't within just the Northumbrian area and then basically be able to drill down into those assets to understand what was going on. And if I just pause it there, you can see it generated an alert to tell uh, Northumbrian Water that there was going to be some form of weather event that may cause impact to the system. So this is really about being more proactive in reactive situations. So when they drill into their weather data, they were able to then see that they've got uh, heavy rain and other information in there in terms of then there's going to be an event and that tells them that there's going to be an issue with the physical system or how it operates. So the idea is to make these uh, splodges on the map, so a heat map for want of a better word, that allows us to be able to understand, or Northumbrian to be able to understand where the issues are within their networks. You can see there in this simulation, this isn't real world, but they need 80% capacity and they've only got 67. So as you click on the splodge, it would zoom into an area. In this area, this is going to be the area that we will be working on for the pilot, which is Berwick on Tweed. Um, and you can see there that it, the reason that there's an issue is the status of some of the pumps. So we can see there that some of the pumps high confidence, some of the pumps are running but low confidence, and one of the pumps is running with very low confidence because it is due to be maintained. And this is looking ahead three or four days. That's all we're trying to achieve. And we can see there that if we change the status of that pump and brought forward in Northern Rim Water's work order system, the maintenance of that pump, it will then have an impact to say that there's a greater confidence in that pump being able to be used on the day, so it won't be as an issue. It increases the amount of predicted availability and therefore returns the map to a great colour. So that's essentially what we're trying to do. And what we're focusing on now is looking at the um, area around Berwick upon Tweed, and we're going to use that for the main pilot area. So effectively, we're going to look at the water and waste water systems. We're going to use the existing um, databases, IT infrastructure that Northumbria have already got. This isn't about creating anything new. This is about um, using everything and bringing it together in a single pane of glass so that people can be more reactive with the data. So whatever we build is going to be agnostic, if, if that makes sense to people listening, in that it, it doesn't really matter what data sets fed in, whether that's people data in terms of vehicle movements, whether that's work order data, whether that's data about the condition of um, other assets, but it's really allowed to move the dial forward by two to three days. So from our side, from Schneider, um, we've got uh, a kickoff meeting which is due to start uh, before the end of this month and then we will be delivering this across three agile sprints. So it's effectively 10 days of work per sprint. The first 10 days we will be uh, spent updating this to focus on the area of Berwick and then the second 10 days we'll start to refine which information comes in and then by the end of the third sprint we will have a working proof of concept for Northumbrian water focused around managing wastewater assets in a weather event which as we all know is one of the things that causes great challenge to any water company is what can you do three or four days in advance of a storm that will then improve the overall outcome for the uh, people, customers within that area. So I'll just hand back to Andre to reflect on some of the things that he's learned from. Yes, thank you, Wes. Yes, I mean, it was amazing. What I have learned is people were hungry and craving for this experience, you know, face to face, you know, kind of discussion, and uh, people wanted to contribute. They had different lenses as to like what the problem looks like and, and how to solve it. And uh, 
I guess it also other things been happening in the background that you know not have not all aware. So Northumbrian water in the background been going through you know approvals processes and we have innovation passport and we've been refining requirement. Schneider would have been going also through refining the requirement and scoping out how exactly we use money for this proof of concept and and further conversations have been happening which I I, I you know, the result is in, in further sort of refining what we are trying to achieve and, and, and ensuring that it would work. And already having that snippet already, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, but having that step forward to be able to, to move in from re reactive to this proactive uh, forecasting and management in the control room um, would, would be great. And I, I look forward to, you know, can't, can't wait to see what happens. And we, 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 you know, we've even thought of a name and I don't know if we can share this stage, uh, you know, the, uh, but yeah, you it, can it share, you can share the well, name, situational yeah. awareness, visualization environment. So, so I, I cannot wait what the safe tool will, will, you know, where we get to with it. And also the, the other room of requirement add on, but that probably for another time. Thank you. Over to you, Angela, please. Thank you. Thank you, Andre and Wes. Uh, brilliant update there. It sounds like you've been very busy since the uh, since the Innovation Festival, which is great to hear. And I also look forward very much to seeing how SAVE can indeed save us when we know we've got a storm event uh, approaching. So uh, I'm sure that we'll be uh, reporting back on that once we've uh, got a little bit further on with the prototyping. So now we're going to head over and have a look at Park Life, which was a sprint uh, sponsored by Oracle. And we have Ahmed Iqab, who's going to tell us all about this one. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ahmed Iqab. I'm the uh, IS product manager with uh, Northumbrian Water Group. Uh, the sprint we did was an online sprint um, a few days before the actual festival, innovation festival, but we're um, a key part of the innovation festival itself because sometimes you, do, you can't be physically present so we're capitalized on the technology the, the the problem we were trying to address was the parking challenge that almost all utility sectors face when it comes to field visits or working on streets uh, especially in city centers um, um mainly for instance in um, down south in london borough it's a nightmare to park a small car not to mention a van where you need to go backward and forward and get your tools in um currently that challenge is costing utility companies tens of thousands of pounds a year in, in terms of fines as well as the customer satisfaction impact because you expect you would expect as a customer ourselves um, an engineer will come in, um, check what the issue is, then goes back and walk about five, six minutes to get his tool and bring it back and then go backward and forward. That's definitely going to upset the customers. Um, that's the main problem that we're trying to do. Um, what went well, we managed to scope and define the problem statement and all its elements. Uh, which has enabled us to look at the actual possible solutions uh, with Oracle. The main thing that was um, difficult to do or to, to obtain was the relevant data um, of available parking from other um, local um, authorities. So it's, an, it's a challenge, uh, but we have came up with a solution to that as well. Um, our plan, we're, we've been working on a solution architecture diagram with short, medium and long term solution, uh, considering the current technology that we we have, as well as the future ones as we complete um, the first few steps. We, the, um, we're, gonna, we're starting with three sample areas uh, that has the worst parking issues, which are Dagenham's, Romford and Newcastle City Centre. The short term approach is basically collecting the information from the field engineers when they go and visit uh, customer uh, premises, as well as the customers when they call us. We ask them, is there a parking space? Is there a parking challenge in your area? Do we need a permit? Do we need uh, to pay for the um, 
parking available in your areas and all that is actually captured in the systems. The medium term uh, is involving the local authorities and on steel, uh, sorry, on street uh, parking providers, the commercial ones, uh, to create some sort of a consortium where we will have a centralized solution. We called it the recommend the parking recommendation engine that would provide the recommended parking place for the engineers. The long term part is generally created a smart parking platform where we could it would be a cloud based. Um, it gets inputs from all of the above, i.e. the engineers, the users, uh, local authorities, um, parking providers, and it will um, basically use the recommendation engine. It will uh, auto book and assign parking spaces um, according to specific jobs real time. Um, our next steps are uh, we're looking at the possibilities internally to in incorporate simple questions to be asked to customers and the uh, about the availability of the the parking that information gets captured and shared with the field engineers through the work orders that are being logged so the capture is happening manually now um, with human interventions asking these questions and adding that to the systems is being done manually however we are in the process of automating an element of that, which is when the when the question is asked, the answer is typed into the work order and that gets automatically um, sent to the scheduled work order. So the engineer, when he gets the job, he will get the recommendation as well from the um, the customer. And that's where we are at the moment. Back to Thank you, you very, Angela. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, definitely a, a very, very focused sprint on a big problem that we have and, and one that if we crack will actually make a huge difference to our uh, field teams, which I think is, is huge. So absolutely brilliant that we're doing that. So I look forward to seeing how you get on uh, working up the, uh, the, the, the solutions that you have. Also, I think you touch on a really important point in that we also have online sprints that enable people to join us that perhaps ordinarily can't join us uh, physically uh, at the race course in Newcastle. So great that you were able to be part of one of those sprints. So thank you very much for that update. That's brilliant. So now we're going to hand over to Martin Jackson and Ant Morse from Virgin Media O2, who are going to share the work that they did on the smart world of the future of work. So over to Martin. Thanks very much, Angela. And as Angela just said, there, I'm joined by Ant, who I'll hand over to in a moment to give the perspective from the VMO2 team. Um, so how did this sprint come about? Um, it was quite a, a macro problem I think it's fair to say some of the other areas that you've heard from today were very specific challenges that we faced as a business and I think the spark for this particular sprint um, stroke hack came about by a conversation around data that the two organizations were having and um, we have in our organization things like our customer digital twin which is there to deliver insights about how we can serve our vulnerable customers and we were quite interested in some of the data services and insights that an organization and a key partner of ours, such as VMO2, would hold that could maybe in some way enhance that and bring another lens to that data that could enable us to deliver better outcomes and new outcomes to our customer base. So that was the spark of the conversation that brought the two organizations together to start to discuss this further. And why is this important? Well, I think both Northumbrian Water Group and indeed VMO2, very ethical businesses, very, very closely aligned values around customer service and communities and all of those kinds of aspects. But I don't think we at that stage really understood the true value and power of the combined information that we held as two organisations. And I think we came together ahead of the event and we started to kick around a few hypotheses around, oh, wouldn't it be great if this data could provide this or answer that question? And um, what would be then the mutual 
kind of benefit that we could then realize from that. But the the reality is we didn't know. So we needed to craft, um, I guess, uh, an event that would enable us to unlock that value. And the event that we crafted actually, because we like the challenge, I think, uh, in the Innovation Festival was, I think, probably our first combined sprint and hack. So SPRAC, I don't know if that's a, if a new thing that we've developed, Angela, but you, you know, it's a thing now. And the idea was really simple, actually, was we've worked with um, VMO2 in the past on kind of traditional design sprints together at the festival, everybody together in the, in the tent going through a design think process. But what we wanted to do was also run a parallel hack using virtual teams, feeding all the same things at the start line, all the same uh, influencers, same data, setting them off in parallel and then converging at the end and then seeing what interesting things have been developed. And we did that and, and, and probably share a little bit more about this, but um, VMO2 have got an innovation council and it was a dragon's den style kind of everybody does a pitch at the end about what they've what they've came up with. So from that we got I think six, seven different groups, either virtually or in the tent, all working in parallel. And some of the influences that we fed in, naturally this was a very kind of people focused, communities, customer focused event. So some of the um influences that we put into that process reflected that. So for instance, um, one of the best, most powerful, uh, I guess, insights I've ever received, uh, a chap called Robin Think from the RNIB came and spoke to us about what it's like to experience a technology through the eyes of somebody who's visually impaired. And it was a really powerful, poignant presentation that, that Rob did to us. And, you know, that made us all really reflect and empathise with, you know, how this data could drive new experiences and new opportunities for a range of different people from different backgrounds. And I think therefore you saw that in, in the outputs and um, all of the outputs landed in very different places, but they all had that real accessibility, empathy for your customer, your community. How can we drive more value um, for those people was, was really the key theme that I think sat across them. So in terms of outputs, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about one and then I'm going to hand over to Ant, who will come in on, on another thing. And the one I wanted to pick out was an opportunity called Data for Good. I think that was the working title that we established. And the idea for this was, was, was I guess, two things. One, we had an interesting customer insight that said to us, if we would share or they would share more information, if they knew that information, they would enable a human to judge them in some way. So, you know, they felt that if, if that information was therefore accessible for a human, that would in some way would mean that human could judge them and could put them into a certain bracket or it kind of maybe a, a bit bias would come in there. And we found that fascinating, to be honest, because that's against everything that your common wisdom tells you about trust in technology and humans and all of those things. So we started to explore that a little bit further. And then the second thing was that was kind of related to that was this idea that Actually, is there a trusted custodian of data where customers, consumers, communities can share data knowing that they that data would be trusted, could be used in a trusted, ethical way for their benefit? And there's some research that backs up the reason why customers don't trust necessarily uh, a lot of organisations with their data. Um, and I, I think we came across a stat which was quite alarming, which was about 30%. It was a Forrester report which said 30% of CEOs globally and admitted to not using data ethically at times, customer data. So, you know, you can understand the reasons for that. So those two seeds came through and we came up with this idea and this concept, which we all felt really strongly about. And there was two water companies, um, Southern Water that was involved in that process as well, along with a team from MWG. In the days and weeks after that, we also found that there was another kind of stream running in parallel that felt like actually the two were quite a, a neat fit. And it's actually an idea that came from, originated from Nigel and a concept called SavePeopleMoney.org, um, which is a URL that actually we've, we've, we've registered. And this idea was around how could we look at those that were in financial vulnerability and actually were applicable for social tariffs and make it so organizations proactively contact those individuals 
So that that's not on them to then go to each of their different service providers, often provide the same data and insights. Um, how could we make that really intuitive and how could we make sure that we identify those those people proactively? So the two ideas have, have converged. I think it, it didn't feel right that we'd have resources focused on on each of those and running in parallel. And where we are now is, as I say, we've got a, a, a team that came together. We are working with some some external partners as well who are supporting us on that. We're starting to talk up to other entities, uh, other service providers. Indeed, I mentioned it this week as well. It might be something that VMO2 are interested in and exploring with us. And we're trying to uh, early in the new year at least develop an initial prototype that we can then begin to launch test and, 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 and go from there. So it'll be very much about establishing a minimal viable product and then building from there. And then we feel like some of these principles that we learned over the course of the sprint could then feed in at a latter point. So that's one idea. I'm now going to hand over to Ant, who's going to talk about a topic that is very, very different to that one, but equally exciting. So over to you, Ant. Brilliant. Thanks, Martin. And hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ant Morse. I'm the Head of Innovation and Account Engagement and Engineering at uh, Virgin Media O2. So the project that I'm going to talk to you about very quickly is um, called Team Tomorrow. And this was a uh, sprint uh, run by Virgin Media Road 2, Northumberland Water um, and Newcastle Council and a superstar of the future, a, a young guy called uh, Matthew Rutherford, um, who brought some fantastic energy and, and focus to uh, to this particular uh, exercise. So what is it? Well, it's an idea and solution based on that kind of Pokemon Go type um, application. Um, the idea is that this is aimed at children to allow them to learn more about careers in technology and to share ideas on and their findings with their friends and peer group. And um, for me, the gamification of this is just brilliant. It brings that learning and gaming uh, together. And we know that, you know, the two are a very strong combination. And if we think as to what the need for this application is um well it's it, it's multiple there's multiple benefits but the key one for me is that we are seeing a progression in technology and development at such an exponential rate that our skills across industry and in education are really are struggling to keep up um, there is a skill shortage, as Tony mentioned earlier, in a number of different industries. And I think if we look to some of the new and up and coming technologies, this is only going to grow. Um, so it's really important that we empower young people. And I think this for me, the, the bit that stood out is this was uh, ideated by a team and particularly Matthew. It was designed for a demographic that, that he was from. It's designed for by him for for him, um, which I think is amazing. People such as Matthew looking at exploring technologies early in their careers, uh, sorry, latter of education, thinking about early careers and what they want to do. So I think, you know, with four generations in the workforce, this is a real chance to learn from the younger generations around what technology is um, useful, what the power of technology, these guys understand it probably better than we do. So what's gone well with this? Well, it just it's just a great idea. There's nothing like it exists really currently. So um, I think we we are onto something particularly strong. Um, it's using a range of different technologies, both proven and some of the up and coming technologies that are in trend, such as augmented reality and the growing IoT market as well. Um, I think it's very achievable, and uh, and as again, you know, it has a very strong opportunity to uh, to really benefit some some individuals. Um, what's been difficult about the project? Well, it's remaining patient. We want to get going on this thing now. It's really uh, we're you know chomping at the bit. We can see the potential and we can see the need. And I think for a collaboration aspect, this is really strong. Um, at Virgin Media or two, we've been taking new technologies such as AR and VR and XR and coding technologies into schools for probably the best part of um, seven or eight years now, and really looking and challenging children of all age groups to uh, you know really use technology. It started as an exercise to see what they could do now they're amazing as and impressing as every day we thought what we didn't know they could do but the uh, bit like Matthew amazes with their creativity we're going to in terms of next steps we're going to get together um, as the as a sprint team and we're going to go out to some of those schools that we currently work with testing new ideas and testing technologies and we're going to take this along 
and actually then look to progress it to its next stage. Again, keeping true to its spirit of actually using the people that, are, that this target, this solution is targeted towards, and that's young people in education looking to learn as skills for the future. So beyond excited, uh, really thrilled and um, yeah, looking forward to the next step. Can't, can't wait to get going on it, Martin, really uh, chomping at the bit for the next steps. Um, I'll hand now back to uh, Angela. Thank you, Ant and Martin. Uh, once again, I uh, love to see that the festival is forging new paths with a SPRAC. Uh, I love that we are continually uh, challenging the norms and coming up with, with new inventions. So fantastic. And I think uh, amazing to hear all of the ideas that you had in the uh, in the sprint and actually resulting in something that you're actually going to go and take into schools uh, and really engage with with the young audience. I know I did pop into your your sprint tent during the event in July and absolutely love to see the involvement of, uh, of some youngsters, uh, especially one of our little helpers in the shape of Matthew, uh, who really, uh, you know, he really came out of himself during the sprint, which again is another really rewarding aspect of the Innovation Festival that people find skills and uh, and talents within themselves that they didn't even knew uh, existed. So uh, fantastic. And like you, uh, can't wait to see uh, what you get on. And I think that pace, with regards to innovation projects can sometimes be one of the more frustrating things, but it looks like you, you are actually up and running at a good level of pace, so brilliant to see. And actually really on reflection of all of the um, sessions that we've run uh, across this month so far, uh, I'm absolutely just so thrilled with all of the progress that has been made and all of the hard work that has been put into making these projects come alive post-festival. A lot of our staff take this on as an extra job on top of their day job because they have passion for what they're doing. Uh, and it is just brilliant to see that even in the face of uh, high workloads that, that work can happen. So um, we will keep everybody informed with how these projects keep progressing. If you've heard something that you think that you'd like to get involved with, you are more than welcome to get involved. We have a newsletter that is circulated uh, once a month. We have our Innovation Connect quarterly that you could get involved with. So many different ways in which you can keep connected to uh, all of the, uh, the innovation projects that we have at Northumbrian Water. So once again, thank you very much to the Smart Tech Bubble. You've done an outstanding job. Uh, keep going, even in the face of things that are potentially getting in the way of progress. And uh, I look forward to working with you in the months and weeks to come. And I'm going to hand over to Martin, who will do a close out of this session for us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Angela. Um, wow, what a session. Brilliant. I think some fantastic ideas. I, I'm not sure where I even start to begin to digest that, but just to touch upon a point that Angela made very well there, I guess the festival wouldn't happen with, without the investment that we get from both our internal teams and people and indeed our partners. But what's really nice about the examples today, they all directly correlate to key projects, key work streams, key strategies that we hold as a business. So particularly in the case of Steve and the Measure Success and Park Life and Ahmed, who were both members of my team, those are real things that we've been looking for and seeking to solve as a team um, over the course of the last 12 months or so. And the event is just an accelerator for that, isn't it? It just enables us to get everybody together that we require to really tackle them. Um, Speaking of measure for success, I think, you know, the holy grail for us was always to try and find that self-powered um, smart meter. And, you know, we, we believe that actually it, it was it was possible. We didn't actually believe it was necessarily out there or there was a, a, a variant of it out there that we could then take and build upon. Um, but again, such as the opportunities you get from the festival, that's indeed what happened. But I guess it also demonstrates that in innovation, Often it's about taking something and actually looking at your context and looking at what your needs are and evolving it. And that's very much what that innovation bids about to make it truly unique and, and a fest for the sector and, and one that will benefit, you know, the, the UK industry as a whole moving forward. So really excited about that one. Very different area there around cybersecurity um, in terms of, you know, skills in cybersecurity. Obviously, somebody who works in digital and somebody who's a close colleague of Tony, it's it's you know it's a weekly conversation 
we're having um digital skills um security is one of those there's, there's others and it's an interesting talent market at the moment and what really struck me about that one was actually it's about identifying the right problem to solve isn't it so the problem could have been perceived as it's a skills shortage actually as tony said it's it's an experience shortage and it's about you know how do you create those pathways because there's lots of talent coming through academia how do we tap into that and how do we take that forward um, in our industry and in others and um, control room of the future you know smart networks is a key cornerstone of our digital strategy uh, in this AMP period in this five-year period up to 2025 but indeed going to be a big part of our plans as we move into the next AMP period and you know for me it's about the visualization as well as the IOT, the operational technology, the artificial intelligence. How do you bring that information together from the different sources? And indeed, how do you make sure that people have got that insight who need it? And what's really nice about that is, you know, there's there's an obvious area here in Berwick, the part of our operating region that we're going to leverage. Um, but also it's it's existing data, it's existing insights that we have and hold as an organization but it's all maybe a little bit disparate and in different places. And that really, that first step is just about bringing all of that together. So really excited to see how the Nanyam Save tool uh, plays out uh, over the coming months. Um, park life, um, really practical problem, but it is definitely one that shows up in our metrics. So, you know, in our response times, you can see it, there's some noise there. And that's as, as a result, partly of you know, people arriving at a job and, and in our field teams and not having an obvious place or an easy accessible place to park. So we believe by tackling that problem, it starts to gain some efficiencies and some performance improvements and really like that there's a short, medium and long term uh, lens on that. So some tactical things that I know Ahmed and the team are getting on with today. Um, so that's fantastic. And also, a potential there to reuse that in other places and, and external people to to benefit from the work that we've that we've done there and then finally um moving on to the the the, the, the kind of work that vmo2 and, and shared there and um, really excited about the outcomes from that i think you know we've touched upon matthew he was an absolute star i think and uh, a jaw-dropping moment when i just observed a 13 year old just just on the whiteboards, commanding an audience of five or six people around him and just explaining how the idea that they'd originally lined, uh, landed on probably wasn't the best one. And actually, through the lens of, of him as an, as an individual, actually, this was a better approach. Um, but again, it taps straight into them shared values, you know, that both um, NWL and VMO2 as a, as a part of ours have around, you know, going into schools, developing, exciting engaging younger people so again really excited and it's a really nice way to be able to do that using technology and all those emerging capabilities that i'm said so i think a real pandora's box for me as is, is obviously a, a tech leader lots of opportunities clear pr progression and pass forward uh, and i think it's you know from our standpoint it's about you know building on those and capitalizing on those opportunities which you know as an organization with our partners and other collaborators will really will be able to do so brilliant session for me i think all that's really left to say is that this session along with every all the others i think angela mentioned that there are available as recordings and um, please share them on you know and, and share them out there we want to get you know our you know key insights and progress and and create a bit of a, a buzz around the event um i hope you've enjoyed the series of five you know it's all very different different contexts and different bubbles and but a huge amount of content there to digest and you know we'll certainly look forward to seeing you all and some in some new people as well i'm sure when the festival comes around next year so thanks everybody for watching and have a great weekend everyone